coming. And hello, Santa Cruz. So, of course, it works out that as soon as you start to present a talk, you notice a typo on your first slide. So just to point out, this should be R, right? So data R available, not is. OK, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about biological data management integration, protein function predicting, prediction, and constructing phylogenies across the tree of life for very complex molecules to make informed inferences of function and structure. This turns out to be a very complex task for a number of reasons, not all of which are scientific. Some of them are social and political. So there's a lot of issues that we have to deal with in this arena, and I'll be talking about several different stories to give you an idea of how this works in actual use. And I'll give you um, an overview of some of the algorithms we've developed over the past several years. So here's our situation. We've got a lot of data. So we've got sequences. We've got protein structures. We have experimental data of different types. But this data is, poor, is R, poorly integrated. So we have a lot of issues here. How do we connect these data? And how do we connect scientists to the data so that we can make rapid discovery? All right, this isn't right. Nothing in biology makes sense? No, that's more like it. So we have to use evolutionary principles to organize all of this data and to make inferences. And this is a famous saying. You've probably read this in many places. Dobzhansky saying about evolution still holds, uh, except perhaps in the White House. So 21st century biology, here it is. We have exponential growth of the sequence databases, and it's not leveling off. It's getting worse. The metagenomics projects, you've heard about the Sargasso Sea and other types of um, exploring environmental sequences are making the sequence databases grow even faster than they have been over the last several years. So we have right now in GenBank, we have on the order of 50 million sequences or so, but this is going to grow. Where are we going to be in a few years? So biologists are having a hard time. They're drowning in this data. And they're not very comfortable with computation. So here's our vision of what we need to do. If you imagine that this is a biologist who has a cool tool, this forklift, see the wicked grin? These are the biologists who don't have the cool tools. So it's our job to enable them to do their jobs more effectively. So how bioinformatics is used in pharmaceutical and biotech companies? Here are some examples. Target discovery. They're looking at finding new targets. So their existing drugs are, are potentially not as uh, effective financially as they used to be. They need to find new drugs and new targets for those drugs. So there are certain classes of drugs that form the major drug target families. G-protein-coupled receptors are an example. Most of those targets have been discovered already. Finding new members of those classes requires remote homolog detection, and I'll be telling you about that. The other issue that a lot of pharmaceutical companies have is prioritizing their existing targets. They may have hundreds of potential targets or thousands of potential targets. Figuring out which targets to work on requires integrating a lot of information over all these targets. So what tissues are they expressed in? What is their potential molecular function? What biological processes do they participate in? There are a lot of bioinformatics methods designed for each of these tasks. They need to be integrated in order for them to figure out which of those targets would be their best bet. So the problems are there's a lot of errors. These errors are in the sequence data themselves. The gene structures are wrong in some cases, and also in the annotations. There's a huge fraction of sequence annotations where the, the predicted functions have been assigned to sequences that are actually incorrect. So here's an example of G-protein-coupled receptor targets um, and the drugs that have been designed for them. So many of you are familiar with some of these drugs, for instance, Claritin, and there's a few other CeraVent here for asthma. The largest fraction of drug targets come from this class. So G-protein-coupled receptors form a huge fraction of the pharmaceutical industry profits. And I'll give you some examples of how new targets can be discovered in GPCRs and how you would actually predict the function of them. The other principle that I find really interesting and exciting is comparative phylogenomics. So in this process, it's comparative genomics. You're taking different genomes from different species and you're looking at how different protein families have evolved differently in these species through duplication and through specialization for different tissues and for different substrates. G-protein-coupled receptors were mapped onto the tree of life to show the number of copies of the GPCRs in these different species. 
And these types of molecular innovations at the gene level are what contribute to the differences in species. So evolution at the genetic level, at the molecular level, contributes to evolution at the species level. And if you look here at the difference between human and mouse, for instance, you'll see there are many more GPCRs in mouse than there are in human. And that's because there's been an expansion of odorant receptors in mouse, and we have fewer of those in human. And there are pheromone receptors that appear to be active in mouse, so it's not clear that they're active in human. There are many different numbers of these receptors in different lineages, but if you look at um, the invertebrates, for instance, and nematodes, you see that there's an expansion of chemoreceptors. So each of these different species has developed new functionality, new phenotypes, new abilities through the modifications of its genetic repertoire. Here's something you may have heard about. It appears that HIV is able to enter cells through these chemokine receptors, and that individuals who have different alleles may be immune to HIV because the virus cannot enter their cells. So coming up with novel drug mechanisms to exploit the genetic diversity is motivated by a lot of this phylogenetic and bioinformatics analysis. Biologists have been working on characterizing genes and pathways painstakingly, and this is an example of a pathway in Drosophila and fruit fly, the toll pathway. There's a toll receptor here, then it transmits a signal through the membrane, and that transmits a signal that ends up turning on um, antimicrobial peptides. This is part of the innate immune pathway of Drosophila. But by using evolutionary inferences, biologists were able to see that there were homologies, which is to say relationships, between the molecules in this pathway and molecules that were discovered in vertebrate lineages. Sequence similarity basically guides these inferences. You can take amino acid sequences or DNA sequences that are characterized experimentally, and you can search databases for sequences that look like those. It's called homology search. And by doing this, you can basically infer that the function of this protein is probably related to the function of this protein. So this kind of annotation transfer is a very pro popular approach in bioinformatics. And as you can see, in vertebrates, there's been uh, a diversification of this pathway, so that it's not exactly the same as this pathway. This is one of the fundamental um, complications of function inference by homology. Pathways change, functions change. So individual molecules may be homologous to a whole set of molecules, but the functions of those molecules may change over evolution. So here's an example of innate immunity molecules in mammals. Here, these are uh, toll-like receptors, and here's the toll receptor and some interactions that they make. And it turns out we now know that they are also related to molecules in plants. So the innate immune repertoire is established in plants. It's very diverse, and it's a very powerful system in plants. And some of these molecules, so for instance, if we look at these domains here, these blue domains are toll interleukin receptor domains. They're named after their presence here in the toll receptor and in interleukin receptors. They're also found in plant proteins that are involved in the plant defense response. And whenever you see these toll interleukin receptors in plants, you discover that they're involved in some type of innate immunity. The plant pathways for the innate immune response are not as well characterized as they are in Drosophila or as they are in human. But what we know, for instance, is that some of these molecules that are turned on in plants and, um, and in insects are also related to scorpion toxin. So this is very curious. So here's a molecule that's turned on by the toll receptor pathway. It's called rosomycin, and this is a a small peptide that has a beta sheet, three different strands in yellow here. So it starts off with a beta strand, has a short loop, an alpha helix shown in magenta, and then an antiparallel beta strand. This drosomycin defensin is related to plant defensins shown here. And you can look at their 3D structures and see that they have a common ancestor and that the fold has been maintained through evolution. Here's an antimicrobial protein, here's antifungal, and here's antifungal. But curiously, they're also related to scorpion toxin. And you can see this by comparing their three-dimensional structures. But this is part of the offense, and these are part of the defense. So the common mechanism appears to be permeabilizing membranes. 
but they've diversified, so they're achieving slightly different functions in these different species. And in plants, you see many, many different copies of these defensins. So they're effective against different types of pathogens. What we don't know exactly is how these guys are turned on in plants, but we do see that they are elicited by response to different types of pathogens. And one can assume that the toll interleukin receptor domains in plants are part of that uh, system that elicits these being turned on. It's known for Drosophila toll receptor that these are turned on from the toll receptor. But I bring this up to also illustrate some of the complications in bioinformatics because if you look at these 3D structures, what you'll see is that not all parts of the fold are superposable. So if you take these two proteins even within scorpion toxin, you'll see that this internal loop is longer in this case, not perfectly superposable with this structure. So what biologists are trying to do is infer function by sequence similarity and by structural similarity. And when the structural similarity is low, when the structures have diverged, it turns out that the sequence similarity is often very low, and it's very difficult to reproduce the actual ancestral relationship between the residues in one protein and the residues in the other. And this type of inference of what are the correspondences between amino acids in one and amino acids in the other is the basis for phylogenetic tree construction. It's the basis for function inference. Well, here's the catch. We've been talking about the use of bioinformatics and how powerful it is, but computer scientists and biologists don't speak the same language. And in order to be effective in computational biology, you have to speak both languages. And most of the training programs that we have don't address this issue very effectively. So we're trying at Berkeley to actually integrate our students in a joint type of training program very early on so they're getting fluency in these different languages. But increasingly what we see is that biologists they're the ones who need to use these tools. But they very seldom have the functionality that enables them to understand statistical arguments, machine learning methods. But they're the users of these tools. So how do we bridge this gap? All right, annotation transfer by homology. We're getting into the technical section. Here's how it works. You have a new genome. You have thousands of genes and you want to predict what the functions are. So you take these sequences, and you run a sequence search program, typically BLAST or something similar, against a large database. You find related proteins. You check the score of the top hit. If that score is significant, you transfer the annotation. If you have additional resources, you might look for protein structural or functional domains using a resource such as PFAM. Here are the problems. Roughly 30% of genes can have no annotations resulting from this process. So you cannot find a database hit with a significant score, or all the database hits are labeled hypothetical or unknown. And of those sequences that have annotations, only 3% have any experimental support. 97% of these sequences are based on some educated or less educated guess, typically by homology. So there's a high error rate in these annotations, and uh, those who, individuals who have looked at these annotations carefully estimate that the error rate ranges from perhaps 8% to 25% or higher. So then you get into a game of telephone. You could transfer annotations incorrectly. So there are three sources of systematic error in these homology-based functional annotations. The first is gene duplication. So when genes duplicate, they're there, and you start off with one copy, you have two copies you can have new functions arise. One copy maintains in the standard kind of case. You might think one copy would maintain the original function. The other one would acquire a new function. But you can also have a partitioning of the functions into different uh, domains. So you might have sub-functionalization instead, where you have tissue-specific types of function or temporal changes. But in any case, these functions can change. So after duplication, this group may have a slightly different function or a dramatically different function from this group. Domain shuffling is another source of error because sequence search, here's your query in sequence search, you find this hit. You can have local regions of similarity. You can call this partial homology because of domain shuffling events. Two genes, one gene can be fused with another to form a longer gene that has additional domains that wasn't present in the original. So if the region of homology is local and you transfer in the annotation, the annotation associated with this protein may be in this red domain, which is not present in the query. And this is a common source of error. 
And then, as I said, you can have percolation of annotation errors. Do any of you play telephone or Chinese whispers as a kid? So this happens a lot. There is a huge problem with annotations and databases being wrong and not being able to detect which ones are wrong, which ones are correct. So phylogenomic inference, this is a, a term that was coined by Jonathan Eisen in 1998, uses the following approach to get around the problem of gene duplication. You have a sequence, you gather homologs using database search, you construct a multiple sequence alignment. From that alignment, you infer a gene tree, which is to say you try to figure out the relationships between the genes in that alignment. So the information in the alignment is used, and it's critical that this, this be correct, to infer a, a gene tree topology. Then you overlay the functions of the genes onto the tree, and also the origins, the species origins. This allows you to then label internal nodes as duplication events or speciation events. Once you've done that, you can come up with a model of evolution that allows functions to change following duplication. So then you know that you really can't transfer annotations from one side of this duplication event to the other side. So genes that are related only by speciation and have no duplication events are called orthologs. And many of the search algorithms for ortholog identification are designed to try to restrict functional annotations being inferred to orthologous groups. So here's an example. All the genes, human, chimp, mouse, rat, uh, fruit fly, and worm here, these guys would all be called orthologs, and these would be orthologs. But across these groups, human and human, human one and human two would be paralogs. So you would assume that they might have a different function. Here's an example of a phylogenetic tree that I built uh, at Solera Genomics for the functional annotation of the human genome for a set of G protein coupled receptors, and here's how you would interpret this tree. You look, for instance, at this sequence. It is labeled hypothetical. It's from C. elegans, which is, say, worm. In the context of this phylogenetic tree, you see that it's nested within a subtree co containing a lot of statin receptors and galanin receptors. These a lot of statin receptors, Drosophila and Limnea, which is great pond snail, are invertebrates. These galanin receptors are all vertebrates. So you would say that this sequence is most likely to be in a lot of statin receptor because it's an invertebrate sequence. These sequences on the periphery of the tree are not nested in a characterized subtree, so you'd have to assume that they might have a uh, totally different function from those that are placed within the well-nested characterized part of the tree topology. This tree was constructed using a heuristic approach that is based on Bayesian probability and machine learning approaches to find subfamilies. So these blue diamonds actually represent subfamilies of several sequences, and I'll be showing you that algorithm later. It's called sci-fi. So I'm going to show you now a few examples of sequences that have been misannotated. So this is a sequence from um, River Lamprey. Here's your GenBank ID. It's labeled a putative odor receptor. If you run BLAST with this sequence, and this is the results I got some years back, so it's different now, I'm sure, you see the top hits are also, here's the, sequ the sequence at the very top is the actual query sequence. It has an E value of zero, which means the, the number of hits you'd expect by chance alone is zero. So this is essentially a uh, very high probability of homology, and this is actually the query, so it's the identical sequence. These three sequences are very closely related. They have very significant E values, but these also have very significant E values. These guys are serotonin receptors and neurotransmitter receptors and a couple of unknowns. These guys are all labeled alternate receptors. So if you were a genome annotation program, you would say, okay, it's an alternate receptor, no problem. But if you build a phylogenetic tree with these sequences and going further down to the blast hits, the sequence of interest here is, yes, nested in a subtree labeled putative odor receptor, and there's the two orphans that we saw, and there's a putative neurotransmitter receptor. So the top hits are clustered together on the tree. But when you look at the rest of the sequences in this tree, what you see are proteins that are part of a very important drug class. So these are biogenic amines, or aminergic GPCRs. These form the hot drug targets. The true characterized odor receptors do not look anything like these guys. So I would suspect, based on this truth, that these guys are actually part of the aminergic GPCRs. They're not odor receptors. Here's a protein that's labeled a human neutral sphingomyelinase. There's actually a, a paper about it, and they explain how to characterize this protein. 
But when we gather homologs for this protein, we find all the homologs are bacterial. So in fact, you can go look using translated blasts with this protein against the human genome, you find no <laughs> matches. So I would suspect that, in fact, this is a bacterial contaminant. But it still remains in the databases exactly as is, because it's a hard problem to actually correct existing annotations because of how things are set up. We can also use evolutionary principles to predict protein structure. So here's an example of a phylogenetic tree where there are available structures for different sequences in the tree. Here's a sequence that's unknown. We can place the sequence into the tree, and by a process called comparative modeling, we use the three-dimensional structures of known characterized members of the family to predict a three-dimensional structure for one of the members of this family. And this is a powerful approach that's um, producing new insights into the potential functions of unknown proteins. And here's one example of that. This is a project that I did with Pat Sambrisky of Plant Microbial Biology here at Berkeley. We predicted the structure of a VIRB4 protein, which is part of the agrobacterium type 4 secretion system, based on a pairwise identity between 12 and 15 percent. And for those of you who know how to do protein structure prediction, this is called deep twilight zone. 12 to 15 percent identity is very hard to discriminate from total guesswork. So this is a picture of the three-dimensional model that we created for this protein, and these are the residues we predict to be critical functionally. This three-dimensional structure enabled Pat to make a new model of how the VIRB4 type 4 participates in type 4 secretion, a new model for how the assembly of this whole system uh, comes together. So that was published in PNAS. There is still, at this point, no 3D structure that is known for VIRB4, so our model at this point is the only uh, idea of a structure for that protein. So at Solera Genomics, we use this whole approach, phylogenomic inference, to characterize the proteins in the human genome. And some of you read this paper. This is a pie chart that shows the proteins classified to different classes and go genontology classes. There was a large fraction of proteins that we could not label, so we left them molecular function unknown. I think part of that is because we overestimated the number of actual genes in the human genome. At the time that we did this, I think we thought there were about 27,000 sequences, and we now think there's probably more like 21 or 22,000, so the number has gone down over the years. So some fraction of these are truly unknown, and some fraction of those were miscalled genes. So here at Berkeley, we've been um, rebuilding phylogenomic libraries based on the ideas that we developed at Solera Genomics, but using new algorithms that are refined to have a higher accuracy rate and also um, faster because we want to cover all genes across the tree of life, not only in the human genome. So this starts off with clustering genomes into global homology groups, which means we can assert that all the sequences in each cluster have the same series of domains. And we do this by sequence analysis, not by um, classification to existing databases of functional or structural domains. Then we expand each of these clusters to include homologs from other species. And we do this because we want to include experimental information from as far afield as we can get. So if we start off with human, we want to include homologs from invertebrates, <coughs> bacteria, plants, everything we can get our hands on. Then we construct a multiple sequence alignment. And what you see here is a matrix of amino acids and then indel characters, dashes or dots. And you can see the homology that is implied by the same characters in these positions. From that alignment, we construct a phylogenetic tree. We overlay the tree with experimental data. We identify subfamilies. And we retrieve biological literature. We construct statistical models called hidden Markov models for the family and for individual subfamilies. These will be used for classifying new sequences, either that biologists submit to our system or that we are ourselves classifying as new sequences are released to the sequence databases. From the alignment, we construct a consensus sequence from which we use this to predict PFAM domains, which are individual functional or structural domains that we can then overlay on the consensus sequence. And we predict a 3D structure and critical residues. And then we use different types of uh, tools to predict where in the cell these genes or these proteins will be localized. So this is an example of a G-protein coupled receptor embedded in the membrane. And then this becomes a book that we deposit in the library. <coughs> 
So we currently have 44,000 protein families and over a million hidden Markov models. And you can submit sequences <coughs> for classification against this resource using this tool here, or you can just browse different libraries, the human genome, microbial genomes, and so on. We've been working to increase our coverage. We have an NSF grant to cover microbial genomes. So we've been pushing our coverage of bacteria. So you can see we're pretty high on many of these different genomes. And eukarya is funded by the NIH. And I'm going to give you um, a quick look at three different algorithms. The first one is sci-fi, subfamily classification and phylogenomics. <clears throat> the input to the algorithm is a multiple sequence alignment. The output is a phylogenetic tree and a cut of the tree into subtrees to identify subfamilies. Once you have that cut, you can then identify positions that might be specifically are important for the specificity of the different subtypes. So for instance, this position, an E in the first subfamily changing to a D in the second, could be contributing to the functional specificity of this subtype. And then we construct subfamily hidden Markov models. I don't have time to go into the details of this algorithm, but it uses profile-profile scoring in order to determine the branching order in the tree, Dirichlet mixture densities to construct those profiles, and then an information theoretic method to cut the tree into subtrees using minimum description length principles. Uh, I showed you this tree earlier, but this is an example of the kind of result that you would get <clears throat> using sci-fi. These individual blue diamonds represent subfamilies predicted by sci-fi, and they correspond to known subtypes. So the information used by sci-fi is only the alignment information, but then when we examine these trees and the subfamilies predicted by these by the algorithm, we find they correspond to very specific subtypes that were identified by biologists. So for instance, here in the opioid receptors, we see that they're divided into nociceptin, kappa type, delta type, and mu type. Here's an example of a book in the resource uh, for voltage-gated potassium channels. You see the predicted domain structure, including transmembrane domains. If you click on this link, you get a three-dimensional structure for some regions of the protein overlaid with predicted critical residues. You see maximum likelihood trees, parsimony trees, <coughs> neighbor joining trees. But I'm also pointing this out because you can see that the maximum likelihood tree now corresponds to the different subtypes found by sci-fi. So we've done extensive studies of the sci-fi algorithm compared to um, expert identification of subtypes and altered to standard tree methods. We find a high correspondence between sci-fi and standard tree methods such as maximum likelihood, maximum parsimony, and neighbor joining, and to expert subtypes. Then we can apply these uh, approaches to predict critical residues in molecules. And we have a number of approaches. This is just one where we use the sci-fi decomposition of sequences into subfamilies. And we overlay onto the structure subfamily-specific and family-wide conservation patterns. And we're able to reproduce the known catalytic residues for the argonaut protein, which is the major player uh, in microRNAs. But in addition, two residues that we identify as potentially very important are adjacent to the active site. They have not been found experimentally, so I propose that they might be targets for experimental characterization. One of my favorite algorithms is called SACHMO, and not just because I like jazz, but because it, it addresses the complications in trying to infer phylogenies from multiple sequence alignment when we know that the multiple sequence alignments are going to have errors when the sequences that are included have different structures because it's very challenging to get a correct alignment when you have variable sequences with very distant homologies. So we um, did a, a study of many different proteins whose structures had been solved. And when you superpose the 3D structures, you can find the correspondence between positions based on the structural alignment. You can then assess how well sequence-based alignments correspond to the structural alignment and measure their accuracy. And what you see is as the structural alignment shows decreasing pairwise identity, and I'm sorry you can't see the left column, that's 50 to 70 percent, 40 to 50, 30 to 40, 25 to 30, 20 to 25 percent, 15 to 20. The fraction of the superposable positions drops. So back to the scorpion toxin and defensins, this shows also as your sequences diverge in species and in function that the fraction of the positions that you can superpose often drops dramatically. But what we also see is the accuracy represented in this area. BLAST is a homology detection algorithm, but it uses pairwise alignment to infer homology. Clustal W is one of the most popular algorithms for alignment. Tea coffee is less well known, but it's much uh, higher accuracy than most other methods. 
we see that their accuracy at reproducing the structural alignment also drops, and there's a dramatic drop here. So below 25% identity, the accuracy of the sequence alignment drops. Now, if you recall, phylogenomic approaches require an input alignment from which you construct a tree. If the accuracy of the alignment is poor, the tree is going to be wrong. Garbage in, garbage out, right? So this is a serious problem because most of our protein superfamilies have many pairs of proteins with 10, 15% identity, and sometimes lower. So if you have that kind of diversity in your input alignment, you expect that there'll be a lot of errors, and then the trees are going to have problems. So Sachmo functions by taking an input set of sequences that are not aligned, constructs a hidden Markov model for each sequence, use, uses profile-profile scoring to choose which pair of sequences to align, aligns those, that pair of sequences, tries to predict which parts can be superposed from the alignment similarity, constructs a new HMM at the node that joins them, and iterates this process until it gets to a rooted tree. So at each node in the tree, the alignment can be a different length. And when you get to the root of the tree, you're predicting the conserved core structure that is common to all of the sequences in the data set. And I'll show you how this works. At this node, and there's a really nice user interface that sh displays the alignment for each node in the tree. At this node, when you look at the alignment, you see that there are no gap characters. So that's easy. So these light blue columns are for identical residues. Darker blue means similar residues. If the columns have no color, it means that they're not very similar. This is a trivial alignment. You just stack the sequences on top of each other, right? But as we move out from that node to this node, you start to see that the alignment starts to get more complicated. So we see some gap characters. It becomes increasingly hard to figure out where to place the gaps. These lowercase letters indicate uh, that these residues are generated from an HMM insert node, which means that they're not actually considered aligned. This is one of the parameters to the Satchmo algorithm. You can decide what fraction of the sequences have to align at a position in order to call that position part of the conserved core structure. At this point, we've decided that you have to have a higher cutoff of sequences that are aligned in order to call a column conserved. Otherwise, it goes into an insert state. This positional conservation is shown here. The smoothed version of that conservation of our moving window is shown here. And we use this to determine which positions to keep in the HMM at that node and which positions to cut out. This is a kind of a masking protocol that's applied at each node in the tree. And here we're moving even further out in the tree towards the root, and it becomes increasingly uncertain. So how can we assert that Satchmo does a good job of multiple sequence alignment? Well, we compare it against that same data set of structurally aligned pairs of proteins. We included homologs that were gathered using the same approach for each of these algorithms, Satchmo, Muscle, which is a very popular approach, and Clustal W. We're calling this multi-PW, means we're gathering many sequences, and then we extract the pairwise alignment of the two distinguished sequences at the end. In the case of Satchmo, we're extracting the pairwise alignment at the point at which those two sequences are joined in the tree. Then for these different pairwise identity bins, we can measure the accuracy of these methods. So Satchmo is in red, and these are the error bars. So what you see is that high pairwise identity these error bars pretty much overlap. Um, Satchmo and Clustal W are very close, and Muscle is a little bit worse. But as the pairwise identity drops, Satchmo is increasingly better than the other methods because it can figure out which positions to align and which positions are not really alignable so that it has more information as it goes towards the root uh, than the other methods have. This means that we can actually predict remote homologies with higher accuracy when the pairwise identities drop into this deep twilight zone. Another thing we're working on is predicting subfamily specificity positions, because one of the questions that many biologists have is not which positions are critical for the whole family, because those you can discover just by looking at the alignment. If position is perfectly conserved, you know it's critical for one reason or another. But subtype specificity positions, you can identify by clustering sequences into trees and then doing comparative studies from one subtree to the next to see which positions differentiate the subtypes and then plotting those on the structure. And this is uh, in progress. So where are we aiming? So this is my penultimate slide. We want to create machine learning methods that enable us to integrate this data <coughs> automatically for a self-organizing map of the universal proteome. 
So as new sequences are released to the sequence databases, they get plugged into this multidimensional network. We can find their homologies, and increasingly we'll be able to propagate information over this network. So some of you are familiar with the SIFTER method that was developed here at Berkeley. SIFTER uses models of molecular evolution over a phylogenetic tree and a Bayesian approach to propagate experimental data over a tree so that you can say, and there are priors over what types of characters you'd expect, which say experimental characters of molecular function or biological process at different nodes in the tree. Now imagine instead of having a single tree, you have a universe of trees, and they're connected in different ways by different types of criteria. So our standard tree methods are based on sequence similarity. But you can also have genes connected by participation in biological processes, or by proximity on a genome, or by recognizing the same substrates or cofactors. Each of these types of relationships can be used to construct a different type of network topology. These different types of connectivities can be used to propagate different types of data. So we want to learn this type of connectivity and use it as an automatic way to integrate information, to identify annotation errors, and to enable biologists to make informed inferences of what biological pathways a new gene <coughs> might participate in, what are the changes in molecular function based on allelic variation or mutation. So there are a number of people who have contributed to this work. Um, Nandini Krishnamurti is a postdoc in my group, and she's been absolutely responsible for driving the biological database development so that it is useful to biologists. Yenna Interian is a new postdoc uh, with a PhD in applied math from Cornell, and she's getting involved in the machine learning approaches to propagate information over networks. Duncan Brown finished his PhD. It was hard to say goodbye, but he played a big role in many of the algorithms here. Sri Ram Shankaraman is a computer science PhD student absolutely brilliant, and he's been playing a big role in the catalytic site detection and in the subfamily-specific uh, predictions. And Carolina Dowell has just joined our group. And then our programming staff uh, made it all happen, and supported by the NIH and NSF. Thank you. Questions? Raise your hand, and I'll take the microphone to you. We will be taking uh, DNA samples on the on the way out through the door, so don't don't forget to leave one. Questions? Any questions from Santa Cruz, Yvette? Hear anything there? <laughs> oh, okay. Come in. Thank, Thank you very much. You.